I'm currently waiting for some prototype PCBs to be delivered for the ROM module project I'm carrying out for the 9830A desktop calculator. And while I'm waiting for those, I thought I'd do a bit of housekeeping that's required on the other two units that I have. I have a total of three of these, and um, in a previous series of videos, I went through uh, updating uh, the tape drive to use a specific type of tape, and um, that worked out quite well. And I now want to go through the other two machines and do the same thing, but I was asked to show how I did the actual update to the tape drive. So I thought I'd uh, demonstrate that in this video. Um, so the first thing is I want to see if this tape drive actually needs uh, updating to start with. I put the tape in and it does the usual, uh, it will rewind uh, indefinitely. So we'll just demonstrate that first so you can see what the actual problem is. So we'll turn the 9830 on. So that's now booted up. And these are the types of tape that I want to use. They've got a nice light coloured uh, case. It's not white, but it um, is quite a good colour for this application. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. That's quite an interesting um, subject on its own. Um, you may notice I've also shortened the tapes. These were 90 minute tapes, but I've shortened them to 15 minutes, uh, which is uh, far more suitable. It puts less uh, wear and tear on the drive and I'm never going to want to store that much uh, data on one tape anyway. Okay, so we'll put the tape in and we'll see what it actually does. So we should be able to rewind it and when we press the rewind key it should stay rewinding until it gets to the end. And if we try to write some data to the tape to um, mark the tape. There's a process we have to go through with this machine to uh, effectively format the tape. So it's just the mark command, so you just type in mark and then the number of uh, slots you want to reserve for the files and then the size of each one. So we'll just put three files, 100 bytes each, and it starts to wind forward and it's looking for the end of the clear leader and that's one of the features of these tapes is they have a clear leader but we can see it can't find the clear leader um, this error is actually a bit ambiguous so we'll take the tape out uh, put a scope onto the test point on the drive and uh, see if we can actually see anything coming out of the sensor So I'll connect the scope to the test point. There's a test point down the back here. You can't see it, but uh, I'll just clip the scope probe onto it. And so the trace on the scope is now the output from the sensor. And uh, if we look at the schematic for that part of the system, we can see that uh, we're looking here and the scope is currently looking at the test point which is the top of the load resistor for the optical sensor. And we should of course get a variation depending on uh, what reflection the sensor is seeing. So if we're keeping on the scope, I'm just gonna put a piece of uh, white paper close to the sensor and it should be responding to this and giving us um, some sort of response as we move the paper across the sensor. But you can see it's doing, it is doing something but um, very little, not enough, and that's the usual uh, failure mode of these sensors. They kind of lose their sensitivity and uh, they, we don't get a reflection from them. So I'll just rewind the tape. So I've got a rewound tape. I put this in and of course we've now got the situation that the sensor is trying to detect and you can see we're getting nothing coming out at all there's no point going through to the rest of the circuit here this is the, the very output of the sensor so if it's not changing here nothing um, further on is going to actually work so i'll get this taken uh, off the machine i'll get the machine out of the way and we can start to dismantle the tape drive and uh, see how we're going to update it Okay, so we now need to dismantle this and get the sensor out of it. I'll just firstly start by removing the tape. 
and obviously what we're trying to get out is this block down here. There are various ways of getting this thing apart, but um, it's one of these machines or devices that's been assembled in such a way that it is quite tricky to get apart if you start trying to fight with it. So the way I found that's easiest is to completely remove this front section. Uh, it's quite easy to get out. Um, you just need to pull these connectors out or you can leave them connected and remove the entire board, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to keep it all connected together. These are quite a tight fit in um, this backboard and I don't like forcing them out. At some point something will break. So I'm going to uh, slacken or remove these screws from the back and this will release this board. This is supposed to be loose by the way, it allows this board to align itself with the connector on the 9830 motherboard without putting any excess strain uh, if there's any um, inaccuracies in the bracket. So this is supposed to be loose but the screws are still tight, they're just on some uh, standoffs. Um, so I'll take those screws out. I can then remove uh, the screw going through the front here, it goes all the way through and then this front section will come off and then that will give us better access to the uh, internal mechanism which is the thing we're actually trying to get to. So uh, if we take this front cover off first, which is what I'll do now, um, then I can uh, show you in more uh, detail as to what we're actually trying to get out. So I'll remove the screw from the end. And so this goes all the way through, so there's a nut on this far end. I think it's actually spinning round. Okay, and I can pull this all the way out. This front cover will now come off. There's a ground strap on here that we want to disconnect. It's just a screw that goes all the way through. And then we can completely remove the front cover. Got the uh, plastic uh, window uh, comes out as well, and it's a good opportunity to clean that as well. So I'll clean and polish that before I put it back in. And uh, what we've got now is uh, this block here, which is this is the bit we're trying to get out. This is the bit uh, that contains the sensor. And so if you look at how this is all put together, you'll see there are some screws on the inside that screw this block in place. So we need to actually remove uh, this entire. Um, hinged part so we can get to the back of it. Again there are various ways of doing this, you can take these screws out and then this uh, centre section will lift out, uh, but I find it easier to take the um, entire front section out, so I'll do that now. Okay, it's fairly easy to get out, you just need to be fairly cautious, um, it is plastic and uh, as you probably know uh, old plastic is quite susceptible to being damaged. So. What I normally do is just slacken off a couple of the screws. You can then gently uh, separate the front section. You don't need to take them all the way off and then this will just uh, lift forward. And as I say, if you need to, you can then uh, release this board if you want more uh, scope, more, more uh, access. Okay, so I'll just do that and um, we'll get back and start looking at the actual block itself. So all I've done now is slacken off the lower two screws on each side. I haven't taken them all the way out and this allows you to just gently separate the two side cheeks and you'll see that they're on a couple of pins and once you separate them you can then lift the uh, entire mechanism forward. Just need to slacken off this one a little bit further and if you take them right off then it's you can remove these side cheeks but I prefer to leave them in place just so I don't have as many uh, realignment uh, steps to complete when I start to reassemble it. And once you've got this released, got the back one caught up, then this thing will hinge all the way forward. So you can now get this thing all the way forward. It's still largely in one piece and it makes it far easier when it comes to uh, the reassembly. You don't need to mess about trying to remember where everything went. And uh, what we have to do now is release this uh, block and board from this panel. Again you can take the entire panel off if you prefer. I, I prefer not to do that, I'd rather um, leave the various parts where they are. There are some 
um, alignment steps if you do dismantle this too far that I prefer to uh, try to avoid. So we'll just take this screw out. There is a spacer behind it, so we want to avoid losing that. And then there's another screw at the bottom. Again, spacer, notice these are different lengths. And so this is now largely released. This is a little plug that you can just gently remove. And we can now unplug this if we want to, and it will give us direct access to this, which is what I'm going to do. I want, because I'm going to be completely dismantling this, so it's easier if we completely remove this from the backboard. So this comes out very easily. Be careful not to leave it down on the board, because otherwise you can damage the tracks. Okay, so once you've unplugged it, it will only go in one way, by the way, so, um, can't put it in backwards well I suppose you could if you pushed hard enough but you'd have to push one of the pins through the board so it'd be quite difficult to do that and so what we've got now is uh, complete access to um, our the assembly we're interested in which is this one so I can now take the two screws out of the back you can dismantle this in situ with it on this back plate um, but it is a real fiddle doing that and I prefer to just remove the entire thing there is another ground screw uh, here, but it's the same cable. So as we have to take this screw out anyway, now is the best time to do that. And now we can easily remove this. And so finally, we can take the screws out that hold this assembly in place. As I say, you can leave this back block on the a plate if you want to but I find it easier to take the entire thing out because we want to take this top plate out as well. Okay and this should now be free to lift away. So it looks like a real um, hassle getting this apart, but it literally only takes five minutes, so it's not uh, anywhere near as difficult as it appears. And now finally we can take this last screw out and um, see what we need to actually uh, reproduce and replace. Okay, so the next step is to remove this front plate and the rear PCB. You can't really put this on the wrong way around, the holes are offset, so um, I do take reference photos anyway, but uh, it would be very difficult to reassemble this incorrectly. And then this front cover will come off and we can pull the board out through the back. Okay, and uh, this is our failed sensor and that's what we need to replace. The main thing with this is to make sure that when we re, uh, replace this that we end up with something that is the correct height. If we get the height wrong then we're going to have all sorts of problems trying to get the tape to work correctly. So uh, when we come to make our um, bushing to support our replacement sensor we need to make sure that the final position of this plate is the correct distance. Uh, from the PCB and that will guarantee that when we put the whole thing back together uh, everything is going to line up. So that's quite easy to arrange of course because all we need to do is make sure that when we make our spacer uh, firstly it will fit into this hole um, but also that when we reassemble the entire thing that this thickness uh, is still the same and this isn't kind of pushed off um, uh, otherwise we won't be able to get the tape in properly. So the next um, decision to make when I did this the first time was what type of sensor to replace this with. And um, I worked as a, an optical specialist for quite a long time and uh, optics is actually very interesting and I think it's one of the subjects that's quite often uh, overlooked or misunderstood. And um, so I'm just going to quickly explain why I chose the sensor that I did. So I'll just grab one of the sensors that I'm using for these machines. Okay, so this is the sensor I intend to use, and this is what I used in the other machine. 
Um, this is a BPW17N and uh, it is a, a quite a, a cheap sensor, there's nothing particularly spectacular about it. I'm just going to explain here why I chose this particular sensor. Um, when we fit it of course we need to stand it off. Now the first thing is, um, although it has quite a narrow field of sensitivity, it's only 12 degrees, uh, we can still contaminate the light going into it if light's shining in through the side and because we've got this incandescent bulb here which is the light source and it's throwing out light in all directions we need some way to screen this from direct uh, light radiation although it's uh, passing through a block the black is the block is quite opaque so uh, we need to make sure that uh, we don't get light going directly from the bulb to the sensor probably still work but it'd just be far less sensitive um, now it might be difficult to appreciate why the light going through this block is a problem. So what we have to consider, and this is a spec sheet for this device, and if we look through the spec sheet the important part is on this page and this is the spectral response of the sensor. Now if you're not familiar with uh, light and the visible spectrum then quite often it can be confusing. You, you look at something and you'll see light, uh, it'll re you'll see the reflection and wonder why it's not working. And it's unfortunately not quite as simple as just you being able to see something. The part you can see in this spectrum is from just above 400 on the left here, probably up to about this point. So this is the part that you can see. And you can see this sensor is not particularly sensitive in the region that you can see it's mostly off towards the infrared end, so on this scale we're going down to um, ultraviolet to the left and uh, infrared to the right. Infrared really is heat. And um, you can see that um, we're up getting on towards 1000 nanometers for the peak sensitivity. And if we look at the output from a typical tungsten bulb, you can see that this is the part of the spectrum we can see that I've just pointed out but this is the output from a bulb such as the one that we have in our little board and you can see the peak output is uh, well into the infrared range of the visible spectrum, in fact it's off the end of the visible spectrum and so what we need is uh, for maximum sensitivity is to make sure that we select a sensor that is able to see kind of towards the infrared end rather than visible um, otherwise we've got uh, uh, very low sensitivity for our system. Although there's light coming off the bulb, the sensor wouldn't be able to see most of that. Whereas if we pick a sensor such as this one that is sensitive up towards the infrared end, then we are getting up towards this point and it's um, far more sensitive to the actual light that we are trying to detect. Um, you, this is one of the things that um, with certain types of sense you do need to be very careful with. If you've got for example LED lights in your lab they will have a much narrower output than this. They might have a very sharp output uh, but your sensor won't be able to see it. For example the tapes I'm using have a clear leader. You can get tapes with what is almost a clear leader, looks slightly red but it will not work uh, in a system like this. And I'll, I've got a quick demonstration set up here as to why that is. Okay, I don't know quite how clearly this will come across on the camera. I don't really know what the spectral response of the camera is. Uh, what I've got here are just three LEDs, a wide in series. I've got a blue one, a white one, and a red. And um, hopefully you can see that they are all illuminated. Now to the naked eye, they're all about the same brightness. I suspect the white might be coming across on the camera uh, much brighter. And uh, the reason for that is of course because it um, occupies a much broader uh, position in the spectral band. Um, and what I have here is a filter off one of the Mark 14 uh, computers. It's just a red filter. It's intended to filter out uh, light for the use uh, of uh, red LED displays. And it's just to uh, increase the contrast so it lets the red through and uh, all other colours it tends to absorb. And that's the thing to bear in mind is that whatever colour you're seeing something like this it's because it does not absorb that colour light. 
um, and all other colors it does absorb. So if I put this in front of the LEDs, so I don't know how well this is coming across on camera, um, but it makes almost no difference to the red LED and the white LED turns kind of red because it's only letting through the red portion of the spectrum and all the others that make it look white are being absorbed and the blue completely disappears. So I don't know if this is coming across on camera correctly, but uh, to the naked eye, what happens when I put the filter in front is the blue light is completely invisible. I can't see any of the blue illumination at all. The white has turned red and the red has made really no difference whatsoever. And uh, that's uh, an important feature when you're det uh, determining what sensors to use for something like this. You must select a sensor that is sensitive to the wavelength of light you're expected to see. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is go over to the workshop. I'm going to make up some um, spaces, of basically a black bush. I'm going to use black Delrin, machine it so that it gives us um, a support for this sensor, but also a shield to prevent any stray light getting into it through the block. Okay, so back from the workshop, I've made up a spacer. In fact, I've made two, one for the other machine. And the way this fits together is the sensor fits up inside, pushes into the recess at the end. This then fits into the recess on the back of the plate. And then finally the block slides over our new adapter. And the length is of course set so that the bottom end is flush with the bottom face of this block. So the whole thing is held together um, once the screws are put back in and the top of the sensor is flush with the top of this plate. Uh, if, you, if, if you're interested and want to make one of these, this is a very uh, quick drawing of it. These are the dimensions in millimeters. I made it from uh, Black Delrin. Uh, you could probably try and 3D print it, but I wouldn't advise it. Some of the wall thicknesses are only 0.2 millimeters, so uh, I think you might have a, a struggle trying to get it to print successfully. Uh, okay, so what I'll do now is uh, get this reassembled. I can fit the sensor in place of the failed sensor and I can use the spacer to give the correct height. And uh, then I can put the block back on and uh, refit the screws. Okay, so that's the block reassembled. I've got the new sensor fitted, soldered to the board. I've got the uh, spacer in there, so it's at the correct height. It all seemed to fit together properly. So I can now start to reassemble the main cassette unit. Before I do that, there is a resistor value that needs to be changed. So it's the resistor back here. You can see it's actually the center of that group of five. And um, after a bit more experimentation, I think I said 180K in the uh, previous video when I was talking about it. Um, but I found that uh, 220k works uh, even better. So I'll be fitting a 220k resistor in that position. And um, I can then reassemble, which is just a reverse of the uh, disassembly procedure. So I get the resistor, resistor change. It's easiest to do that now before I start to reassemble. And then we'll get back and we'll put this back together, put it back into the machine and see if it actually works. Okay, so I've replaced that resistor, so it's that one. It's actually labelled R4, but um, it's the designator's underneath the resistor, so you can't see it till you're taking it out. But it's the third one down from the corner, and as I say, I've replaced that with a 220k resistor. It's one that's connected to test point one. And uh, what I'll do now is uh, refit the board, uh, screws up into this position, and then we can start to reassemble the front part of the cassette mechanism. Okay, so now we can start to reassemble the front part of the cassette mechanism. And it's just a reversal of uh, what we did to take it apart. So we start off by refitting the block, just a couple of screws that hold this in place. Okay, and then we put the earth strap onto the head itself. Okay, and then the next thing is to reattach the uh, cable to the mechanism and then this board 
to this part. I'm going to do this off camera just because I can't really see around the camera very well. But all I'm going to do here is plug this back onto the head. Obviously it faces this way round. And then this cable goes back and these pins go into that board. I just need to make sure it all lines up properly. I don't want to break anything by having to reach around the camera. So uh, I'll get back on camera in a few minutes and um, then we can just refit the remaining part of the front cover. Okay, so I've got that plugged back on. So this cable will just plug straight into this board and the head just connects directly to here. The next thing we have to do, of course, is reattach this board to this part of the mechanism. If you recall, the long spacer comes from the bottom end. And all we do here is put the bolt through the board onto the spacer and then through into the uh, top part of the sensor block. Let's get it started and then we'll do the same with the top one and just go through there and in the same way screws to the plastic housing. So it's screwed into plastic so it doesn't need to be too tight. Okay, and then this is the advantage of not taking this whole thing apart. We can just refit uh, the spacers onto the side. And then all we have to do is the reverse of what we did to get it apart. And that is just making sure that the side cheeks clear the pins on the side. I'm just trying to make sure that uh, this is staying on camera while I'm doing it. And then the whole thing will just slide on and drop into place. So as you can see, that's now back where it's supposed to be. Just make sure the cables are out of the way of the solenoids. Okay, and that just then leaves the front cover. I'm just going to go and give this a bit of a clean and also clean up the uh, Perspex window. And then this is just really a case of passing this bolt all the way through the front. It goes through the holes on the side, down this channel, and then this holds the front of the mechanism in place. Okay, I've cleaned the front plate. I've given the window a good clean. And so now we can do the final reassembly. Before I uh, put the front cover on, I just want to tighten the side screws. Okay, and that just leaves the front cover to be fitted. Before we refit it, we do of course have to refit the ground strap okay so now we can do the final part of the reassembly so we put the window back in make sure the ground lead isn't fouling anything we can put the long bolt back through Okay, and then all we have to do is refit the washer and the nut off the far end. Okay, so that's the entire mechanism reassembled. Just make sure it clicks shut, which it does, and opens properly, which it does. Just make sure the sensor appears to be in the correct location. And we don't have anything fouling on the back. Okay, that looks fine. So the next thing is we'll get this put back into the machine and uh, see if it actually works. Okay, so I've got it plugged back into the calculator. We'll hook up the scope to the same test point.
Okay, get our piece of test paper. Hopefully you can see the scope and uh, turn on the calculator. And we should now be able to see some change as we move the paper across the sensor, which we can. So that's looking fairly promising so far. I'll put a tape in, so this tape is not wound to the clear leader. So we should have a fairly low output. Close the door. Okay, and if we re now rewind the tape, it should keep rewinding when I release the key, but also it should stop at the end and we should see the signal on the scope rise. Which we have done, so that's looking good so far. Next thing is we'll try and mark the tape. Okay, that was successful. So it looks like we now have another unit with a working cassette. I'm going to do this uh, same exercise on the third machine and um, I should now be able to move tapes from one machine to another. So just to prove that I'm going to take the tape I created um, for the plotter test. I don't have the plotter connected but we should still be able to load the program. So this is the test tape I was using in the other machine. We'll just get it put into this one. And this is what I couldn't do before. I couldn't change tapes from one machine to another. They wouldn't read across the different machines. Let's make sure we're rewound and we'll try and load one of the programs on this tape. We'll see if we've got anything and it has indeed loaded so that's good it uh, means that uh, this tape um, can now be used across these two machines and then hopefully the third uh, but the modification has now worked successfully on both machines.